Good evening. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here with you, and my late mother would scold me if I didn't start properly. I had home training. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, American Atheists for this very generous invitation. I'm delighted to be here to have an opportunity to chat with you. I'd like to share a few ideas and then reserve some time for us to have conversation. I'd also like to thank two others, uh, the late Dick Gregory, and also Annie Peer Avery. I think on some level you might appreciate my humanism and my atheism, but these two figures, among others unnamed, worked hard and gave up a lot to make certain to work towards the opportunity, a different world in which blackness was not a death sentence. And so I am grateful for all they've done. And here we are in 2017. And you shouldn't be surprised by the violent response to difference, a kind of violent and vehement disregard for difference. This is not new. I'm surprised by the surprise. This is not new. This is the way in which this country develops. It develops in large part based upon the resource of those who have been disadvantaged and disregarded. 114 years ago, the sociologist and historian uh, W.E.B. Du Bois tells us how this is working. He argues that if you really want to understand the nature of the 20th century, think in terms of the color line. That life within, collective life within the United States, as he understands it, is defined by this sort of vehement opposition to difference. And he wants to frame this in terms of a particular community. In 1903, he frames this in terms of a particular community, and he does that in light of two related questions. First, how do you address the Negro problem? Think in terms of when he's writing 1903. Reconstruction has come and failed, and rather than formalized system of slavery, now we have a more difficult barrier. Legal and extra legal discrimination. And his question is, how do you address this? How, how do you work on this? And everything he comes up with fails. He looks at Booker T. Washington's strategy. Booker T. Washington, 1895, argues in Atlanta, look, when it comes to things that are about the economic well-being of this country, we are like the hand. When it comes to issues that are social and cultural, issues of equality, or we are as separate as the fingers. And Du Bois looks at this, is troubled by it, doesn't see this as a solution. He looks at religious communities. This is a man who understands the nature and meaning of black churches, and he wonders if black churches provide a way out of this dilemma for us, but they fail. Everything he posits is only at best a short-term resolution. But his argument is you continue to push, you continue to work. And there's a more perplexing question that Du Bois raises really early in this book, The Souls of Black Folk, 1903. Early in that book, he raises this question, how does it feel to be a problem? And he's asking this of African Americans, how does it feel to be a, a problem? And Du Bois says this, that white folks who approach him never really ask this question explicitly, although they all think it. Instead, they ask him about the weather. And you know, I know a good Negro man who lives in our town, and can you believe the atrocity of race relations in the United States? But they never ask the fundamental question, how does it feel to be a problem? And for Du Bois, they don't ask the question, and he doesn't have an answer. But again, for him, it's a matter of struggle, perpetual rebellion, an effort to do, to say no to injustice despite its persistence. 
There are ways in which Du Bois brings together competing worlds in a kind of creative tension. And I know something about this personally. It is my life. For the first 25 years of my life, I was involved in church ministry. When I was a preteen, I was preaching, condemning folks to heaven or hell, depending on the behavior and my particular read of scripture that week. This was my life. I was a young preacher. Before I could go to the store alone, I was leading prayers in my church. Before I could leave the city on my own, I was determining who was righteous and who wasn't. This was my life, trying to hold together these sorts of issues. This was my way of being. And over the course of time, I would lose some of this because what I preached and what I was told within the context of my church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, didn't match lived experience. That I was learning to answer the questions that folks weren't asking and accusing them of a lack of faith when they asked questions I wasn't prepared to answer. And while I was growing up in Buffalo, New York, I struggled with this. But when I went off to college, it was a very different world. I encountered folks in the classroom who thought of the Bible as simply literature, no different than Richard Wright's Black Boy or, or Thoreau's Walden. And I didn't know what to make of this. I, I didn't quite understand this text. I'd read it from cover to cover, but I didn't quite understand it. But everything I had been taught suggested to me that I should be uncomfortable with that. It's not just literature. And some of them I would confront and tell them that, you know, this is the wrong way to think and what this is going to get you is hell. Now back home, that meant something. People got nervous, but on this campus, they just looked at me. You know, my tools didn't work, right? I had what I thought was dynamite to throw and folks should be upset about this and they just looked at me. And I'd venture off campus into West Harlem, not West Harlem 2017, but West Harlem 1982, and I'd venture into Bedford-Stuyvesant, where I, I worked as a youth pastor, and that was Bedford-Stuyvesant, 1982, not 2017. Those coffee shops that now litter those streets didn't exist when I was in Bed-Stuy. And everything I had been taught about the significance of faith and what belief in God could do for you seemed to have no bearing. I was dealing with young people who were literally dying. And one of the things I did was work with young people. We had an after-school program that took place in the basement of the church. And one of the goals then was to just get them to, to think, to, to master language, that if they could write, they could say something about themselves and the world. So I'd tell them, for 15 minutes, you just write. I don't really care what you write about, but for the next 15 minutes, you have to write. And I just assumed they'll write about boyfriends and girlfriends and the new pair of sneakers they were getting. But most of them, too many of them, had an easier time describing their demise than thinking about their future. They wrote eulogies, 16-year-olds writing eulogies, and I had no response. Everything I'd been taught to provide as a response to tragedy, to trauma, did not work. And it became increasingly difficult for me to hold on to this. Like Du Bois, I'm trying to keep these competing claims, these, this tension. I'm trying to keep it creative, but I'm having a hell of a time doing that. As a graduate student, it reached a point where I had to come to a realization. I, I had to move in one of two ways. I, I could preach what I did not believe and live fairly well doing that, preach what I did not believe or have integrity and leave. So I wrote to my bishop and indicated that I was surrendering my ordination. I couldn't do this anymore. I told the local church that I would not be back and had to rename myself, re rethink myself. So, so much of the religious tradition was easy to give up, but there was this concept of God that took a little doing. I had given up Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and that was relatively easy because their punishment involved economic loss. Maybe I wouldn't get that dollar for the tooth, or oh, I wouldn't get those toys that I wanted. But this concept, and that's all it is, this God concept, and that is all it is as a concept, had a different type of punishment that cut beyond what I could have economically, right? So this was a bit of work, but I decided I had to surrender that. 
And it took some time, and I met some good people who actually helped me rename myself. That I thought atheism, and I did humanism. I thought atheism, and I did humanism. And then I found like-minded folks like you on most issues. But although I was no longer a theist, no longer a Christian, was now a humanist and an atheist, I was still a black man living in the context of a very demonic and death-dealing society. And I thought on most things we would agree, but on this, I found too many who had the same sort of backward thinking about issues of race that I thought I was leaving and leaving the church. I'd gone to a Southern Baptist high school. It was a feeder program for institutions like Liberty Baptist and Bob Jones University. You get the idea, yes? And so backwards thinking with respect to race, I understood. And in leaving that environment, I thought I was leaving that behind. But I really didn't. Some of the most bizarre comments concerning race and difference. And so I would do my part, play my role, and I'd give talks related to race and difference within the context of our movements, and I'd do what I could. And I decided at a point, after a meeting at the American Humanist Association, a conference, we had a conversation. I thought it was a really interesting conversation. I decided after that, the negative fallout of some of that, that I needed to do this a bit differently, that perhaps what I needed to provide was a series of do's and don'ts. For humanists, atheists, skeptics, you pick the name, do's and don'ts when it comes to race. And so what I'd like to give you are just a few of those do's and don'ts. And you can do with that list what you will. I want to be positive, so we'll start with the don'ts and then move to the do's. First, and keep in mind, I'll think, I'll, I'll think and I'll talk from my particular context, right, that I do not represent all so-called racial minorities. And why shouldn't our positive conversation concerning racial difference not have the same sort of complexity as the problem, right? So if you really want to hear about Latinx experience, invite someone, right? If you want to hear about Asian American experience within the context of this movement and notions of difference, invite them. I speak from a particular context, right? And we'll start with the don'ts. Don't approach African Americans and ask them, why do African Americans embrace a tradition that was used to oppress them? Don't ask that question. One, it demonstrates a lack of familiarity with the complexity of religious engagement within African American communities. And for us, atheists and humanists, it hides the real question we ought to be asking. Why haven't our movement been more attractive to African Americans? Right, first in terms of this complexity. Right? I, I was for 25 years a Christian, and within the context of that 25 years, I was never told, never taught to believe that race did not matter and racial justice was important. What the problem involved is this. There was a commitment to racial justice, but piss poor tools for achieving it a commitment to racial justice, but a theology, a set of doctrines that were incapable of getting folks there. Right? They were trying to run marathons based upon training for sprints. They just don't have the tools. Why do I say that? Because if you take seriously the religious history of African American communities, you will see some Christians who are not doing very good work with respect to racial justice, right? who bought the party line and have accepted a bizarre sense of their own inferiority. And they'll address that and fix that somewhere else, not here. But you also find some who understand that their particular religious commitment requires them to do something in the world. It seems to me this is one of the only ways you can explain figures like Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, Nat Turner, Baptist ministers who said racial justice is so important. If white folks have to die for it, then white folks have to die for it. 
there's a complexity there. And if you push beyond the period of slavery, if you push into the 20th century, think in terms of the civil rights movement and years past the civil rights movement. Black churches, like all churches in the United States, post-civil rights movement declined. Numerically, they declined. They lie about it, but they declined. Black churches began to experience an increase, a bump up, in the 1980s, in part because you have a black middle class that believes it has played by the rules, did everything it was told to do post-civil rights movement in order to get the goods. That if you went to the right schools, used English in a particular way, lived in the proper communities, you could have access to the American dream. But what happens? They hit that race ceiling. And they've hit it and realize that they've not gotten everything they've been promised and they've surrendered a whole lot. Many of these folks go back into black churches not because they believe the theology, that they're concerned with the sermons, but because it's a space in which they don't have to explain why they're angry. They don't have to justify they're angry. There's a nod of familiarity, I understand, I know why. It's a space in which they're able to catch their breath. And if listening to that sermon and hearing that theology is the price they pay for an opportunity to catch their breath and not have to explain themselves, they'll pay that price. So not all African Americans who remain involved in these churches are doing so because they are saved, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled. They, they believe what the preacher is telling. No, it's, it's a community that provides a certain type of cultural connection that is worth a whole lot. But not just cultural connection, social networking, economic op opportunity, political connections, right? That they are getting something out of this. And so this is why they're there. But again, the better question is, why don't they find what we offer more compelling? And I'll say this, work on separation of church and state is necessary, it's wonderful. Science education is necessary, it's wonderful. But it does not help explain why being black and walking through a park is a death sentence or being black and walking through your neighborhood is a death sentence. And to simply bash the religious communities out of which they are coming doesn't meet the need. They know the churches are inadequate. Damn, that's why they're leaving. But what do you provide as an alternative? And you can't just think that alternative. There are ways in which folks already and always need a sense of community. And the kind of work that we provide doesn't always meet that need for connection, for understanding, yeah? So until our organizations and our movements meet that need in a consistent fashion, they won't come, and when they come, they won't stay. Don't ask, why do African Americans embrace a tradition that was used to enslave them? Don't be content with comfort. If you are involved in justice work of any shape or form, and that work allows you to remain comfortable you're probably doing it wrong. And I say this because if you were doing work towards justice, it requires something not just of the people out there, it requires something of you. You've got to surrender something, yeah? You've got to surrender something. If you are doing this justice work, it requires you to surrender something. And so if you remain comfortable, you're probably not doing it right. I want to quickly give you some do's. Do understand the nature of white privilege. And don't think about this simply in terms of economic well-being. It's a much more pervasive sense of entitlement 
and rightness, yeah? So think about it along some rather mundane lines. You probably experience white privilege if you go to a restaurant and they sit you near the bathroom and you simply think the place is crowded. You're probably experiencing white privilege if you're driving down the highway and police officers come up behind you and you think, well, maybe my brake light is out. You're probably experiencing white privilege if folks around you experience a stereotype of your community and don't necessarily think it applies to you as an individual. Right? It is a general sense of entitlement. Learn about it, interrogate it. Gain some racial knowledge and don't be lazy about it. Don't simply go to those so-called racial minorities and ask them to educate you and make you feel better. Do some work. It makes absolutely no sense to me for communities that pride themselves on logic, reason, and critical thinking that they would understand it as justified to say, I don't understand, I don't know anything about this, and then just drop the mic. Do the work. Doing the work will demonstrate that you're serious about the issue. Finally, this is my takeaway. Unless our organizations that indicate they are interested in issues of difference and diversity and understand those as an opportunity as opposed to a problem to solve, think about difference and diversity and are interested in this, organizations and, and are interested in this, unless they are willing to rethink their infrastructure, examine their leadership, and reassess their resource commitments and their mission, unless they are willing to do this in light of issues of racial justice, they need to stop talking about diversity. Make fundamental changes to organizational structure in such a way that it positions you to really do work concerning racial justice. If you are unwilling to do that, then just shut up about diversity and we can just be about other business. One last thing, I think that is so very important that we give organizations an opportunity to think the structure in light of their commitments, that this is what I would love to do. That if our major organizations could select spokespersons who are authorized to begin this sort of conversation, I would like to invite them to Rice University, to my campus, along with grassroots leadership to really think through how we do this in a way that causes fundamental change in how we understand ourselves, how we structure ourselves, come to my campus, we'll chat for a few days, and we'll be about the business. Otherwise, let's just not talk about this anymore. Thank you. So my understanding is we have about six minutes for conversation, but we can also chat outside after this. Questions? Let's see. Um, let's see any hands. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> when, when you say we should inform ourselves about the, the African American situation or whatever, can you recommend some specific readings or sources? Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly, certainly. I'd suggest you read uh, Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, yeah? Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. And there's a wonderful documentary, I think it's still on Netflix, uh, 13. You really need to check that out. I mean, these sorts of texts will give you some sense of what we're up against. And when I say what we're up against, I don't simply mean African Americans. I mean justice-minded U.S. citizens. It, these sorts of texts will give you a basis for conversation, a point of understanding that puts us here. On your right. Hey, hey. Um, you know I'm interested. 
and I feel a little self-conscious and almost ashamed that I'm not up to the point where I'm doing the right things all the time. Um, I think I have a lot of the issues that you mentioned in the don'ts, because I know for me, I've asked many times, why do you? But of course, like I know, when you say it, it makes complete sense to me. So anyway, I want to do what you're suggesting. I want to come to Rice University. Um, I went through this in the 80s, and it was hard. It hurt. I spent a lot of time crying and not understanding why I didn't get it. But I want to do it again. So I'm wondering, when can we do this? Get the leadership together. We can come up with dates. and. I'm game. Again, I'll provide the space. Come on down to Houston. The weather will be good. And we can wrestle with this for a few days. I'd also say this, that we have to have benchmarks. It took a long time for us to reach this hellified situation. And so my sense isn't you address this and resolve it overnight. One of my favorite philosophers is the North African Albert Camus. And I love what he says about Sisyphus, right? If you've ever read this short essay, it's, it's the title essay in this wonderful collection, The Myth of Sisyphus and Other Essays. He concludes this four-page essay with this, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. <laughs> Not that he is, but one must imagine Sisyphus happy. Part of the takeaway he wants us to have is the sense that we continuously and perpetually say no to the thing that offends us. Right, so we don't necessarily get it right the first time. What I'm concerned with is a commitment that allows what we say and what we do to be consistent. And recognizing that the ways in which we harm ourselves, our environment, are ongoing. We learn something new about them each time we address the question. But the key is a, a perpetual no to the thing that offends us. Not that we get it right the first time. Over here in the middle. Yeah. Um, Dr. Pim, I was wondering what your thoughts are on uh, groups like um, black non-believers in terms of maybe being a short-term solution or something that would be, that's, it's good to have groups like that in the long term. I'm just curious about your Oh, thoughts. sure. I mean, I think it's a wonderful organization and it's a good arrangement, right? I'm, I'm, I would never say, that, that folks should not have time apart. My concern is if these larger, more publicly recognizable, better financed organizations are really about the business of racial justice, this requires hard work that involves restructuring themselves, putting this sort of work in the mission so that if they don't do racial justice right, the organization has failed, yeah? And then using resource to conduct their own business, but to also lend a hand to smaller organizations that are trying to do this work in a more targeted fashion. Okay, to, to the right. I just wanted to make a comment, and perhaps you could respond to it, which is that I'm very, very pleased at the increased diversity in the lineup that American Atheists have done at this convention. No doubt, right? If I didn't think the organization could do good work, I wouldn't take three days out of my schedule to be here. <laughs> right? But my concern is we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back for too long, right? Because there is attention to difference and diversity, but that attention to difference and diversity has the same look, so to speak, yeah? That it's rather targeted. And, and my concern is that it involves our time together over the course of three days. But what's the impact once we leave Charleston? Right? If the organizations continue to have the same sort of structure, the same sense of mission, the same budget in terms of how resource is used, we've made no difference. We've just felt good about ourselves for three days. It's the equivalent of, and I'm, I'm a you, you. Right? I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Association. It's the same as Unitarian Universalists patting themselves on the back for the work they did on racial justice in the 60s. Yeah? What are you doing now? So if this, these sorts of conversations don't foster real systemic change within our organizations, we've just talked. Okay, we've got one more here to the right. Yes. Um, I'm uh, Miss Annie Pearl Avery from uh, Alabama, and I got involved with the SNCC 
in, in 1961. But uh, at this point, out of all the times I've been to jail and all of the uh, times that my life was in danger, I'm still doing things. Uh, I've changed, uh, I didn't change it, I just added on another task that is not glorified, there's no money in it, but it must be done. Um, and the thing about it is, I was associated a lot with Miss Ella Baker, mm -hmm. and she was associated with Miss Septa Clark. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot out of being associated with people like Miss Baker that made me to be what I am today, whatever that is. Uh, but I'd like to come to Bryce University. Matter of fact, I think I know some friends there or something. I don't know, I went to school there or whatever. And uh, my part of my thing in the community now is teaching, mm -hmm. like uh, about Af ancient African history, um, civil war, slavery, and so forth and so on, because there's so much information in that. It, it seems to be unimportant now, but it's very important that blacks and whites learn this. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend of mine that was in the civil rights movement with me, and uh, we met in 1963 in Atlanta, and we still talk together. A lot of us are dead now, are dying off. And sometimes when I talk to her, she don't get it. She'll say, Anna Pearl, why did you say that? I said, but Constance, you're not black. That's the reason you didn't get it. Uh, I'm just saying, she know about racism, but right, immediately when I explained it to her, she got it. I said, you're not gonna be stereotyped unless you go some, go, uh, uh, un unless you like I am, or unless I'm with you. Uh, I see you know who your great grandfather is. I don't know who my great grandfather was. My name is Annie Pearl, but what would my name be if my people had been able to practice their culture and their language? It certainly wouldn't be Annie Pearl. Uh, and we have to think about the thing. Her great grandfather is Winston Churchill. I call her a privileged radical. But what, what I'm saying is that, that I'm, you know, some of the things you do, I do. And I don't try to take people too fast because they're not always where you are. Mm -hmm. Like you, was, you mm -hmm. were saying, that you have to, you know, work your way into that. Uh, explain certain things, let them go to references, give them resources or references to go mm -hmm. to. And the people who are really serious would do something, they'll either read it, mm -hmm. understand it, and ask questions. It's not gonna happen overnight. Right. You have to be committed to do these things. It's not enough to be committed to go to a march or a demonstration. What happened after that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of hard work after that, door to door, one on one. Um, I kind of support your position in, in, in terms of that. Um, and that's what I do now. I didn't know whether to ask you whether you think I need to add on something or take away something. You do what you do, and we appreciate all of the effort and the hard work and the sacrifices you made on our behalf. Thank you.